Ghost Herd, behind the scenes gathering the truth about 265,000 missing cattle. It started as an American success story. The Easter Day family took a couple hundred acres of farmland in rural Washington state and grew it into a farming and ranching empire worth millions. Then it all came crashing down. Ghost Herd is a story of family and fraud, but also a story about the value of dirt and the shifting powers in the American West. Creator and host Anna King explains how she got the story. Moderating this session is Kara Williams Fry, the general manager of Northwest Public Broadcasting. Kara came to NWPB from central Pennsylvania, where she served as the senior vice president and chief content officer at WITF. There, she was the driving force in growing the newsroom staff, establishing news programming, documentaries, and multi-platform projects. Her groundbreaking work in co-creating and launching PA Post resulted in the first statewide digital news organization in Pennsylvania. On a national level, she was the managing producer of a syndicated wildlife program from NBC Enterprises. Throughout her career, she has dedicated a lot of personal and professional time, creating numerous stories for the Children's Miracle Network. Please welcome Kara Williams Fry. Thank you. I didn't know about the video. But anyway, so good morning. Welcome to the last day of symposium. I am Kara Williams Rye. Didn't know I had an introduction, so it's on my script. But this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing our feature speaker. Um, we are delighted to welcome award-winning journalist Anna King. Her coverage shines a national spotlight on the Northwest, from complex nuclear waste cleanup to mysterious cattle deaths. Her work can be heard on NBR and its member stations across the country, including, of course, Northwest Public Broadcasting. She has worked here at Northwest Public Broadcasting since 2007, and she's also a senior reporter for the Northwest News Network, commonly referred to as N3. Ms. King received the David Douglas Award, History Award, from the Washington State Historical Society in 2016 for her Daughters of Hanford series. She's won numerous awards, um, including a regional Edward R. Murrow Award for investigative journalism, and that's the story you're gonna hear about today. It's a subject of the new Ghost Herd podcast, and this, the download numbers on Ghost Herd is very impressive. To date, it's over 700,000 downloads. That's pretty impressive. So please join me in welcoming Anna King. Well, I gotta get down the King level here. Um, I'm just so happy that you guys are all here and thank you so much, Kara, for that wonderful introduction. And um, I just wanted to do my thank yous up front. Um, I wanted to thank the Murrow College and NWPB for having me here this morning. I wanted to thank my husband for always being at my side, cooking chicken dinners when I'm too tired. And I wanted to thank the podcast team, including editor Jim Gates, project manager Whitney Henry Lester, project producer Matt Martin, and photographer Megan Farmer. Also. NWPB's Caitlin Nichols and Jolene Lowey, and again, our fearless NWPB general manager, Kara Williams Fry. I wanted to also thank KOW in Seattle and NWPB for supporting this work along with Washington State University. Thank you to my editor, Zach Hirsch, and past editor, Phyllis Fletcher, who edited this speech. And thank you to my colleague, Courtney Flatt, I call her the flat for being my key grip and sound gal right here. Um, I wanted to thank the Northwest tribes who have continued to work with me for more than 20 years on bringing stories together. And I wanted to thank everyone I've interviewed and talked to for the research in this project and a special thank you to Alan Schreiber. I just wanted to give you a quick warning that this story includes a little bit about a car crash and a possible suicide. So if that's a trigger, please feel free to do what you need to do. Um, I was in my 20s when I first met Alan Schreiber. 
And he was convinced that I was a mess up the first time he read my byline. You see, I was a young Tri-City Herald reporter, and I'd come over from the Tri-Cities by myself to work there. And when I moved over to the Tri, um, I had this little Honda, and it was like my parents were like shoving Costco toilet paper into the back of the car as I was trying to depart. I was like, Mom, Dad, come on. And they're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, to toilet paper in the back. Because they knew that I was moving far away across the Cascades, and, and they wanted to take care of me still. I knew crops a lot because I grew up near the Puyallup Valley. And so I knew berries, rhubarb, tulips, cattle, but I had no idea about asparagus. And I went out on this asparagus story and this old farmer, he was like crotch the old farmer and he was retiring because the asparagus industry was bad. And so he told me, he's like, yeah, these roots are 12 feet deep. And I wrote that down in my little notepad and I was like, oh, okay. And then it turned out that made Alan Schreiber real mad, real mad. So I go and I was at my little desk in my little cubicle at the Herald and I had this like desk phone and it, you don't know, rings. I pick it up and I'm like, hello, this is Anna King. And he's like, what the f are you doing talking about 12 foot deep roots of asparagus? And I'm like, well, I mean, that's what the farmer told me. And he's like, uh-uh, come up north of Pasco and I'm gonna show you some asparagus. And so I went up in my little Honda and I'm like, it's a long way up there. It's like, it's like 45 minutes out of town and I'm like driving there and I'm like, there's fields whiffing by on both sides and I'm like, okay, here we go. And then I get up there and he grabs this shovel out of the back of his pickup and he says, get in the truck. And so I get in the truck and I'm like sitting there and I'm like, mm. and I've never met him before in my life. And then he's like, he grabs that shovel out of the back of his pickup and, you know, and then, and then he's, and he's like digging like a fury. He's just like, and he's like, and then he brings up this crown of asparagus. I don't know if you've ever seen asparagus grow, but it grows in this beautiful circle, like a satellite dish or like a UFO. And it, and it pops, all the asparagus pops up out of this crown. It's kind of like a bulb of a tulip. And so he digs that up and he shows me the roots and he's like, are these 12 feet deep? And I'm like, no, no, they're probably not. You know, <laughs> they're, probably, they're probably just a couple feet deep, maybe if on a good day. <laughs> and um, I never forgot that lesson. And the lesson is that simple stories are often the hardest and it's the little things that get you. So Alan's still one of my top sources. And he grows lots of different things. And he just loves, he takes so much joy in schooling me on crops. He grows hundreds of different crops, different varieties of things. And so he'll be out there and he'll be like, what's this? What's this? So we'll play a little tape here. What do you think this is? Purple Brussels sprouts. Purple Brussels sprouts. <laughs> this is later planted cauliflower. This is fennel. Uh, of course, you know what this is. Basil. This is basil. Red nap cabbage. This is some late uh, later uh, broccoli, cucumber. And as I said, this is in farmer's market. This is all organic. These are peppers here. These are tomatoes. So you're probably wondering about now, like, why are we talking about asparagus? I thought I came for the cattle. You did come for the cattle. We'll get to that. But I'm telling you about Alan Schreiber because he was one of the first people that I asked about the Easter days. And, um, you know, by this point, you might have heard about Cody Easter Day. 
He would end up inventing a ghost herd of cattle that only existed on paper, scamming Tyson fresh meats out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's one of the largest cattle swindles in US history. Turns out he had gambled away generations of his family's wealth. In our podcast, Ghost Herd, we start the story back in the late 50s with Cody's grandfather, Irvin Easterday. Everyone called him Irv. And he moved the family from Nampa, Idaho, from 300 acres of undeveloped desert land in the Columbia Basin. So he wanted to develop that. Um, they benefited from what's called the Columbia Basin Project. Now, the Columbia Basin Project is where irrigation water was poured onto the desert through a government program, especially um, trying to help World War II veterans give them jobs and give them a way to go after the war. And so Irv's son, Gail, would have been a teenager when he moved here. Now, Gail is Cody's father, and Gail spent hours on a caterpillar leveling and clearing the sage-studded desert land in those early days. Gail grew the farm, but about any, as any farmer will tell you, there's only two to three bad years from disaster, and Gail and his wife Karen had to file for bankruptcy in 1987. So Gail and Karen had several children, but we're back to Cody Easterday. He's the baby of the family, and Cody would become the family's leader. As a teen, he started working over the family farm and helping his mother and father. Pretty soon, he was expanding farms and ranches into a massive operation. Okay, guys, so this happened just in Cody's watch. He was a teenager when he started building a farm that was 300 acres to tens of thousands of acres across multiple states, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, Florida. So they had two massive feedlots, one in Benton County and one in Franklin County. And those operations, he ran tens of thousands of real cattle. So the Easterday family went from humble beginnings to having large homes, a private plane. They hired pirates. They owned potato and onion processing plants in Pasco and even Florida. They had a home in Arizona. And then his sisters and brothers, well, they had a forage company, a hog business, construction companies, large restaurants, one right on the Columbia River. They still have that. These were a network of family businesses that helped each other. What I mean by that is that the potato waste out of his sister's potato processing plant went to feed the hogs and the cattle. But then that beef was processed and might end up in the sister's restaurant. So it all kind of swirled back in another sister's restaurant. Um, and so, you know, rodeo cowboys I've talked to, they call that living the dream. You know, it's pretty good when you have all of your family working together and making each other richer. Here's Alan again. I don't like using the word empire, but they had a really big, really nice operation going. There's no two ways about it. They had a really nice farming operation. It's, it's enviable what they had. The Easter days were all humming along, but then there was this massive, massive secret just below the surface in the darkness in addiction and pain. And then a dramatic crash kills Cody's dad, Gail. Here's how we describe it in Ghost Herd episode one. State control 911, what's the location of your emergency? December 10th, 2020. Uh, highway I-82, milepost 13. Milepost 13, okay, what can I help you with? At 3.30 p.m. on the east side of Pasco, Washington, a driver reports a major accident on the interstate. Uh, I, I looked up and I saw the semi truck coming into the westbound lane. Okay. I didn't actually see the collision. About uh, 9.15.31, okay. The eastbound semi was hauling a trailer full of potatoes, a common load here in a region where agriculture is king. Uh, 
Uh, there is a semi truck blocking the westbound lane after he hit uh, what looks to be two pickup trucks in that on that side over there. One of those trucks was a maroon Dodge Ram 1500. Five, five. Sounds like it was the wrong way, truck and semi. The driver of this pickup had gone the wrong way up an off ramp. According to the police report, the semi tried to swerve left to avoid the oncoming truck, but couldn't and slammed it head on. The driver of the maroon truck didn't survive. The 79 year old was killed by the blunt force of the crash. And this is when. This is when the whole Easter Day story begins to unravel in a big public way. It's not clear what exactly happened in that crash. There's a big question mark. But in court documents, the family says Gail had Parkinson's, that it was just an accident. But it wasn't, but he went on the wrong way on the ramp, but he could have driven like hundreds of times. And a lot of people in the community suspect that he might have taken his own life because of the swindle. You see, like Cody's wife in court documents, she says that Cody that very day had a meeting with Tyson. And that you've probably seen Tyson meet in your grocery store and Cody admits to the giant food company that day that he's stolen their money and he's made up this massive herd of cattle. The Easter days say Gail never found out about the scam, but it was shortly after Gail Easter day died in that crash that I started getting texts and calls from farmers who thought maybe something was going down between Tyson and the Easter days. And it turns out they were right. Something was going down. Several days after Gail's crash, Tyson reported to the Security and Exchange Commission that one of his beef operators had a lot of missing cattle, that its first public document that went up in the case that something's, something's going sideways, boys. We now know that Cody Easterday had a bad gambling addiction. He was playing on his phone with the cattle futures market and lost nearly 200,000 or $200 million over 10 years. So in the court documents that I, that I read through really thoroughly, I saw that there was this one description that just caught my eye, but his wife in a letter said she would wake up in the middle of the night to this cr crashing glass sound on Cody's phone or like a, like a roulette sound or a slot machine sound um, on his phone. So it would be like or and she would wake up. And that was when he was either earning or losing money on the futures market. But he turned around and kept his farm afloat by tricking Tyson and another big Seattle company out of $244 million. He made up 265,000 cattle. Those, that amount of cattle could not fit in 10 of these rooms. It was a stampede of a secret. How did Tyson find out? A couple of years ago, plants across the country were shutting down with COVID. You remember how scary COVID was at the very beginning. And um, all these meat plants were shutting down. Well, the problem is those cattle are on a timer. When they're, when they're being fed a special ration and they're being readied for market, they come due, they're like a crop. They come ripe at a certain time and you have to process them or they get too big for the saws. So it's really tough when Tyson, a plant that processes hundreds of animals a day, goes down for a long time. So Tyson was worried about its big backing up beefy problem across the country a tide of beef. And they noticed a lot of inventory on the books outside of Pasco. No one had publicly named Cody Easter Day yet. There were all these closed door meetings. But, you know, Easter Day produced 2% of Tyson's nationwide percentage of beef. 
in their program. That's a lot of beef. And soon there were whispers, and I have big ears. So when I called the sources in the beef industry I'd known for a long time, they chastised me for asking questions. They tried to throw me off the story. They questioned my integrity. So I dug in. Just a few days after Tyson says their operator is missing cattle, other Northwest businesses started filing public liens against Cody and the family's operations. They were concerned about getting paid. Then in January, the, the Easter Days sell their North Lot, which is like this uh, huge feedlot in Franklin County, north of Pasco. It's a massive operation, and it goes for millions of dollars in like a day. Like it was the Easter Days, and now it's not. And that's pretty fast for a property that big. Tyson finds out, and they're hotter than a red iron. They're so mad. And they basically file suit right away. That's kind of that they sold the North Lot to another beef company that wasn't Tyson. So that's kind of like if Nike sold the Reebok factory and, and then all the shoes are still inside. All the cattle were still on that feedlot and they were Tyson's cattle, but Tyson had no control anymore. Then an old source not Alan, tells me he wants to hand me a bundle of documents. And we meet in a dark parking lot after work, headlights in my eyes, and I'm nervous. I remember getting the call, and I hadn't seen this guy. We talked, you know, I, he's a source of mine, but we hadn't talked in a while. And he's like, Anna, can you meet me? And I'm like, okay. So... I, you know, I tell my editor where I'm going, and I say, I'm going to go to this parking lot and pick up documents, and she's like, I don't know, Anna, do we really need those documents? And I'm like, yeah, I think we need them. So we go there, and right on the hood, he just, he just takes out of a manila folder, he takes out these documents and slaps them on the hood, and we're looking at him in the headlights, and he's like, look at this, look at this, look at this. And it was incredible. It was all of Tyson's grievances laid out there in black and white. That's not the first time that documents have been handed to me. You know, I get documents through my mail slot at home. Sometimes people hand me crumpled manila envelopes after a public meeting. People email me anonymously um, through uh, oddball email accounts. But it's, it's nice to receive that information if you're able to because it kind of can help your investigations. Tyson had filed this lawsuit in Franklin County and it just blew everything wide open. Finally, I had the proof that something really was going down and that I had then my challenge was convincing multiple editors that this was really a story. They were kind of like, cattle, what? Made up herd, huh? And then they were like, are you sure anybody cares about this? And I just told them, hey guys, this is one of the biggest farming empires in the Northwest and the nation, and it's going down. And a major international company going, is going after one rogue cowboy. It's a David and Goliath story almost. And personally, I couldn't believe it. I'd known Cody for years. You know that little cubicle I was telling you that I sat at? I was like right in line with my editor. My editor was like just from me to Courtney. And she'd look over her cube at me and see what I was doing. And then I'd type. And, and, um, but at the time, I, I, you know, I would answer the phone and, and there would be Cody. And we'd talk about cattle and alfalfa. So it wasn't like we were going to backyard barbecues, but like I knew him. I knew who this guy was and you know, I could hear the sprinklers in the background sometimes when he was out there. So that farmer I told you about, Alan Schreiber, at the very st start, he kept feeding me information along with a lot of uh, my other longtime sources. For days, my phone was blowing up after that first story text, PDFs, county assessor reports, 
drop pins and different properties, all from their cell phones from fields and pickups. It turns out that there's an entire underground network of farmers that are sending each other information from, from cell phone to cell phone out in the fields, and I was tapped in. Nothing travels faster than gossip in farm country. I'd known all these sources for nearly 20 years, and they were all trying to help me unravel it. So in early February of 2021, it all falls apart for Cody. He declares bankruptcy for both his farms and ranches operation. And that massive bankruptcy lasted about two years. One of his major properties is this massive farm. And it's, it's so large that like you have to see an airplane to like get a sense of it. But if you did get an airplane or a drone and you flew up over it, I was on this gravel road and it winds up this hill outside of Finley and you wind up this road and the sun was coming down and the bend of the Columbia River just like glints in the distance and hawks are flying off power poles. They're going, ka -ka, ka -ka. you know, I mean, it's just crazy. And like, you're just looking across expanses of corn and wheat and different crops, and it's just one of the most gorgeous places I've seen on earth, and I've been a lot of places. And then you think about how big that place is and that it sold for more than $200 million, and who was bidding? Bill Gates and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, two of the biggest farmers in America. So if you think about this story as a whole, it's about a family and a fraud and how it unraveled, but it's also about the value of dirt and the shifting power dynamics of the American West. There's a lot of big changes underway, not just big for big families like the Easter Days, but for farmers everywhere. Farmers are aging. 40% of American farmland is owned by folks over the age of 65. And their kids or even their grandkids can't afford to take on the family farm anymore or they aren't choosing that as a lifestyle. That means that 100 some acre farms that your uncle and your auntie had or like my family had and, and those farms of your grandparents, they're gonna be gone. And it means farms are becoming larger and larger and selling to massive corporations. There's, a re there's research showing that nearly a third of all U.S. farms will likely transition in ownership in the next 15 years. And it's hard for young farmers to like get a, get a start. There's interest rates, the corporate competition, land availability, the scale to get it all started. And there's new throngs of corporate settlers coming to the West. Land is power and it's shifting, but it's shifted before. I want to play you a little piece of tape here. That's Bobby Connor and her brother, and we were up on Immigrant Hill, or, and also known as Cabbage Hill, outside of Pendleton, Oregon. And it was sunset, and she was picking little thist thistle seeds and other seeds out of the tail of her horse because they itched her horse. And these barbed seeds, if they get stuck in the tail long enough, the horse will rub it off, you know, rub off his tail. Bobby Connor is a member of the Columbia or of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Reservation, and she says that her and her relatives still fish, hunt, gather roots, and celebrate their ancestors through their rich indigenous traditions. And she says it's a common myth, one taught in my school days, that Native Americans didn't really own the land, that they didn't because they didn't have a deed at the bank or that they didn't know where the land was by distinct boundaries 
put down on paper. But Bobby says her aunt and her grandmother were old enough to remember traveling the seasonal round as girls. They'd travel by horseback for thousands of miles each year through the mountains, on the rivers, on the plateau. And she told me this story. She says Northwest tribes used to leave tools on the landscape in certain places. So um, I was uh, in the backseat of Grandpa's Chevrolet traveling along the Grand Ronde River when I was young, I don't know, I don't recall precisely how old I was, but <clears throat> Grandma started singing a song, an Indian song, a tribal song. And when she got done, she kind of giggled and looked at Grandpa and said, I couldn't remember that song. I thought I'd lost it, but I must have left it here. <laughs> Which for me was... Um, not clear until much later that um, our people lived a very active, productive life on this landscape. And so we had tools and belongings and burials and teepee poles and um, history all over this landscape. And so when she was a child, she had traveled the same similar routes on horseback um, south towards Granite and Sumter and Ukiah, over to Catherine Creek, over into the Minam, um, down over to the Snake River, down the Snake, back up around the Snake all the way um, to the Tri-Cities and home again. And she knew the land in a different way than I know it, intimately, as did her husband. And when she talked about leaving that song there when I was a little girl, it stuck in my head, but I didn't understand it until later, working here at home, I began to realize that we left heavy stone tools, mortars, pestles, uh, you know, grinding stones, um, clubs, things made of basalt that you wouldn't carry in your saddlebags from camp to camp. We left them on the landscape where they belonged, where their utility occurred, and we would come back to that place each year and expect to find them there, crossing stones, marking stones for places, um, stories in the rocks. Those all had a home, and for her, she had left that song along the trail, and she had found it along the trail. I'm sharing that story because it's important, because the violent transfer of land from native tribes to white settlers and farmers transferred the power to, and the descendants like the Easter Days, even my own family have benefited from all of that. So back to Cody Easter Day, He's been sentenced to 11 years in the federal pen, and he's ordered to pay back more than $244 million. So far, he's paid back $65 million. And let me just say that, you know, Cody's a rural person, and, and I'm a rural person, and I, I just have a lot of empathy for him and his family and that they'll be forever changed from this process, from this story. And I've tried to talk to him. I texted him. I called him. I sent registered letters. I dropped a letter on his porch. And I'd still love to talk to him. Cody visited his old football coach the day the wire fraud charges came out. That, quote, that coach said, quote, through tears of regret and sorrow, he expressed his disappointment in himself and the anguish he felt for disappointing all of us, as well as his mother and children. And in another letter from his cousin, quote, his voice cracked, he was ashamed, he was very humble. You could tell he was beating himself up for letting so many down and bruising the Easter Day name. Remember Alan Schreiber, that cantankerous farmer? You know, he 
he reflects on this in the podcast, and he says the punishment is harsh, but the family are the ones that will ultimately be paying the price. I don't, I don't feel sorry for Cody. I feel sorry for the people around him. Now, I want to give you a kind of epilogue to our story. The Easter Day Empire lives on. Cody's sons have started a new business called the Triple E Farms. They're farming way down towards Walla Walla and even down towards Boardman, Oregon, and clear up to North Franklin County. And, uh, you know, a farmer source sent me a video the other day. I was, I was rolling in my rig, and he sent me a, a video from his rig, and he, he showed me the decal of the side of that truck of the new Triple E Farms, and it's rolling the same steerhead brand, just the names changed. Cody's not backing down from Tyson. Now he's suing them. He wants nearly $12 million in cattle care expenses from the meat giant he says the company never paid. Cody wants to charge Tyson interest too for another $51 million. And Cody wants Tyson to pay him for the using his pitcher on packaging in Japan without his permission. He's also filed an antitrust suit against Tyson, claiming he wasn't paid millions for some of the cattle that the company took on. Finally, I just want to leave you with this. Journalism is writing the first draft of history. No pressure, it's just the truth and your reputation on the line. It's a tricky thing, and it's hard to tell it with empathy and to get it right. I'm still tailing the story. Thank you so much. I'd love to take some questions if you guys are, if you guys have some, and um, Courtney's gonna mic us up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just curious, at, at what point did Tyson become suspicious? And I don't have a full understanding of the meat packing industry, but why were they paying him anything if he wasn't delivering any meat to them? Yeah, so that's the tricky part. So Cody always kept this margin of real cattle. He was really producing cattle on his place, but then he just inflated his numbers on top of that. And the way that the cattle industry works is that um, Tyson buys the calves when they're young, little, little tiny guys, they buy the calves and then they're delivered to Cody's place and then Cody feeds them for a while and he turns in invoices for the feed. So by inflating his numbers, he was getting that money, but he was never paying out for feed and he was never paying out for the cattle that he was buying, supposedly. So um, it was basically uh, an embezzlement scheme. Could I answer some more questions? You guys gotta have, come on, I wanna tell a story or something. so it was an interesting story. But I'm kind of surprised Tyson got bilked because if this is how they raise cattle, did, weren't, wasn't there a question mark, and I don't know if you had the chance to talk to anyone there, wasn't there a question mark like suddenly they have 265,000 head? I mean, that's way more than they'd done business with before. So that was the, like, why, how, how come they believed it? Yeah, you're totally right about that, and I did question them. I got one meeting with Tyson, and there was like five lawyers staring at me on Zoom, and I was like, air it. And so I, I was typing furiously and trying to take as many notes as I could, but they wouldn't allow recording and they wouldn't go on the record with me. It was just a background meeting. And I did ask them that question directly. And they just said, you know, big operations. And, you know, they, and I said, is there an inside person for Tyson that was helping this go together? And they wouldn't answer that. They said, no, they didn't believe so. So yeah, there's still many open questions, but that's a really good one. Thank you for asking. Hi. Uh, oh. Couple questions, sorry, Ooh, that's loud. Um, 
Well, it's interesting. I'm fascinated by this because uh, we own family property up at uh, Twin Lakes, Idaho, and there's a big Easter Day ranch at the. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is gorgeous. uh, You know, I was just, I don't know if it's sold or not or what's going on, but this leads to my second question. Um, Was it, did Bill Gates end up getting the farm over the Mormons that when they were. Who, who the Latter Day Saints won oh, it. Oh, they won. Yeah, okay. they well, or they they purchased it. Yeah, so yeah. There's there's that, and then does the Easter Day family? I know they have land everywhere. Is two hundred and forty five million dollars? Is that a dent, or will that sink the family business? It seems like they've already branched off and gone their own mm-hmm. way. But do they have the real estate and the capital to pay a fine of that amount? It's hard to see inside their personal family, you know, their own business finances. We can see the window of the bankruptcy, and we can see what documents have gone there. But the entire family business, like I was describing before, includes sisters and brothers and connections, and there's, there's all these tentacles of business that go out from the major family. So... It's a little bit difficult to see all that. But the interesting thing, I think, is that that property is the subject of an article that I wrote, and it's in the archive. You guys can look it up. You just, you know, uh, search Cattlegate Anna King, and all the, all the articles will pop up. But I went to that Idaho ranch, and I explored all around in there with, with residents of that lake. And it's a jewel. It's beautiful, you guys. It's like on the edge of this gorgeous lake, and these meadows just roll out like velvet from the edge of the lake, and then they go up into the mountains. And, and on that edge of the lake, all you can see is Easter Day. You know, everything you can see is Easter Day on the end of this lake. And so, if that property sells, there's a major question: Is the aquifer safe yeah. that runs under that property, and so and and runs into the larger basin? that feeds all of Spokane and Spokane Valley and some of those areas. So um, there's major ecological implications when properties that are this large change hands and what they're used for. Development, ranching, agriculture, or, or set aside for an easement. So. For sure. For, for those that don't know, it's in the shadow of Mount Spokane. It's beautiful. And what you said is, is right. And just the last thing, Cody, how old is he and um i can see how something like this can can happen i mean it's uh, it's hard not to feel and what he did was wrong but you know a lot of these people have these hidden addictions and you see something like this unfold and it's like oh it just makes you sick i'm just curious to know how old he is he's in his late 40s early 50s and so it's you know i his birthday might be on the cusp there now but yeah, he's he's around in that in that end zone there. But um, yeah, I think the sad part I would think would be that uh, just as your children are reaching their maturity, his children are all in their twenties, and just as they're taking on this farm and taking on responsibility and could really use a father advisor he's going to be absent from a lot of large part of their lives and so that is a i think that would be a pain point for the family is just missing that growth by the time he gets out in um 11 years you know they'll be in their 30s 40s and and maybe they don't need him as much you know what i mean like there's that point in your life when you're an early adult where you really want your mom and dad to say yeah, take that loan or do this or do that. You know, it really helps. So thank you so much for the questions. <laughs> you guys got to ask me a story question. Yeah, so I, this will be a bit of a follow-up question to your story. What is the reputation of the sons like now? Is it a bit of a sins of the father don't reflect on the sons? Do people in the community trust them? Do businesses trust them? Or are they, you know, still tainted by what their father did? Are they having a hard time keeping the business going? So they have a couple of complications. They've got one of the most massive dairies in all of America down towards Boardman, Oregon. And that dairy has a lot of controversy around it. It's been uh, kind of a, a 
ecological nightmare, so to speak, before they took it on, and they've been trying to get it licensed as a dairy through the state of Oregon, and it hasn't been able to be licensed so far uh, as of you know, last week. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is hard because now they're trying to grow their business, but they're really, they're really running into a wall. If they can't get this dairy to go, it could be really detrimental to their operations. So, but the. Did he get approved because of their father or just because of the land and the way it's run? Uh, it's because the previous owner did some real ecological damage and there's high nitrates in the wells and there's other questions about the property uh, as whether like how many cattle can be on there, should there be mega dairies in Oregon at all, there's a lot of things going on. There's even legislation um, that is being trying to be passed to limit uh, mega farms like this in the state legislature. So it's a real question mark whether it will continue. So I have time for one last question. So where was the SEC in their regulation of this? I know you mentioned them at the end of the Tyson thing, but like you were just talking about the mega farm oversight, where is the government uh, regulations and laws that are supposed to protect us? They did, they did slap Cody with a couple of fines, but I would say for, for a, I mean, I don't really wanna say an opinion, but it wasn't significant money compared to the money that was rolling through the Easter day operation, I guess is how I would word it. You know, there was some fines, but it wasn't, it wasn't huge. And maybe that's, you know, maybe that's up for change in the future, I don't know. But, um, okay, one last, I'm just gonna tell one tiny quick story. Okay, here we go. Okay, so, the moment that really scared me during this whole podcast that I had to, t that I was trying to tell was the moment that I knew in my mind that I had to go to Cody's home. I had to go there because otherwise he could always say, well, she didn't never reach me. She didn't try. She, I, why didn't she come over and try to talk to me? So I brought this letter and I was like shaking like a leaf and, and my photographer, Megan Farmer and Matt Martin, my producer, were sitting in the car and they're all like duck and cover. They're just like, and I was like, so I've almost been eaten by, um, by dogs on the job before. Like there was this one time the St. Bernard just like basically almost ate my lunch. Just, just was like, he was up on my window in a full size truck. His head was right at the window and he was like, ah, like that. And I was like, oh. So I was scared that there was gonna be a dog on the Easter day property that I was gonna have to encounter. So I went, I crept up and like, I was like, come on guys. And they're like, uh -uh, we're here, we're staying in the truck. And so I got this letter and I rang the doorbell and I was like, my throat was tight and then my stomach was kind of like, uh, and like, I, and you know how you just like, you just brace yourself. And I just, but I knew I had to do it. I had to be fair. I had to try to get in front of them. And then nobody came to the door. And so I slipped the letter you know, poked up from their welcome mat. And then this little old dog, like a little old, you know, I'm not sure what kind of dog it was, but just a little short guy, like a little, little scraper. He kind of waddles out and he's like, Whoa. and I was like, okay. And so then I ran, like hightailed it back to the car. And then like we peeled out of the driveway, but I knew that I had tried and I knew I had gone there and then I had tried to give it a fair shake and I still would welcome his comment. And I just really appreciate you guys sticking with me through this whole presentation and if you have any questions after, I'll hang out for a minute. But thank you so much. <laughs>